Arcus and Terry with you. Hopefully you guys can hear us and see us okay. Had a little bit of some tech difficulties, but we should be ready to go now. Let's hope everything is going to work. So if you can hear us, let us know by typing something in the box, and hopefully it'll pop up here on the screen. There we go. All right, so there we are. Excellent. Now, hopefully everything works on our live stream for my other business. Uh, we kept dropping the signal, so I had to have the cable guy come, and there was literally a 350-foot cable across our yard that needs to be buried. So hopefully the dog does not dig that up and ruin our live stream. I think we'll be all right. So how is everyone doing today? Type your answers in the box. Let us know if you can hear us. Uh, Terry, want to give us a sound check and say hello? And Hello, everybody. Great day to be sober. Stormy day here in California. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's been cold here in Florida, which it's Hello, funny everybody. here because Great Florida cold is like 50. California. So, you know. Okay, let me see. We might have an echo on this audio. Let's see here. Okay, that should fix the echo. All right, cool. So today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about, and hopefully you guys like using this board here so you guys can see some stuff. I think it's a little bit fun uh, to switch it up and everything. Today we're going to be talking about alcohol triggers and relapse. So if you are listening in, what I want you guys to do right now is I want you to type in your biggest trigger, the thing that makes you want to drink the most, the thing that makes you say, ah, screw it all, um, let's drink right? So for me, that would probably be like a fight with the spouse, money issue, um, stuff like that usually are the major triggers. Also, uh, when I'm not feeling good is a big trigger. Um, so let's write some of these on here. We'll go ahead and do triggers and we'll put some of them in there. So for me, it'd be like fight with spouse, uh, money issues, all right, Terry, what are some of your big triggers that you get? Um, well, you know, isolation would be a big one. Isolation? Okay, cool. Isolation, you boredom. Some... You know, a lot of the times I drank because of that. You know, there was – I experienced a trigger last night when I was catering, um, and that was one that I didn't expect. But, uh, but you know, it wasn't that big, but I did recognize it as a trigger, and that was um, – we were setting up uh, like a Mediterranean tray with stuff. For this catering event, and there were those green olives that I used to ah. put genies, and I had one. I was like, "Huh," and then I had a couple more. I was like, "Whoa, that really reminds me of the martinis I used to drink." So there's one right there. Okay, so taste. Yeah. I'm gonna put smell also because they're kind of taste and smell. Uh, we have uh, tired and bored. Okay, so we'll put boredom, tired. Uh, we also have uh, depression. Depression. Okay. And we have, like, weekends. Uh, I'm just going to put party for weekends and friends and stuff like that. Party. Uh, weekend. Friends. Okay. Cool. Yep. So these are the major triggers that we have. What we're going to do today is we're going to talk about what we do. Right? What does Terry do when he has the olive? And it's like, hey, wow, a martini would be good right now. Uh, what do I do if I'm, like, cooking with wine or I taste something or uh, something reminds me of the smell of beer or uh, whatever alcohol I used to like? Or sometimes even when I see or smell whiskey, uh, I was on an airplane uh, going to California, big, long flight for uh, five hours, and I was sitting next to the guy who just happened to like the exact drink that I used to like. Uh, so I smelled it, and, you know, it was kind of a trigger. Also, you know, sometimes it's a trigger when you're in the airplane because it's like, Ain't nobody going to know. I'm going to get off this plane, go to my hotel. I could totally get away with this. Um, so sometimes our minds play tricks on us. Linda says, uh, these these are good ones coming in. Um, and Terry, if you want to read them off, that would be good too. So we got um, self-esteem. Yep. Social anxiety. Um, social anxiety. Weekends being around drinking friends, of course. That's, a, that's an important one. And being yeah, depressed. True. Definitely big. Um, so, yeah, a lot of these are, are pretty common, pretty big. Uh, now, Terry, let, let's start with you. What, which ones of these could you say are, like, something you've dealt with? Um, you know, not, not so much the depressed, because uh, when I got sober, my depression was gone. During when I was drinking and trying to quit, yeah, depression was huge. 
because I couldn't figure out a way to quit without going through the uh, the detox. So uh, it was really painful, and I'd get all depressed, and then that would bring up the anxiety. Um, I see the social anxiety is a little different, but uh, for me, social anxiety absolutely. I thought, you know, I have a couple drinks, and I'll be the life of the party. Yeah, and um, it to improve my self esteem. I think for me, it was more of uh, not imp to improve my self esteem, but to squash the my non self esteem. Really, got it. Okay, yeah, yeah. And then, okay, so yeah, like uh, the self esteem one's kind of interesting because we have this idea that we need to have self esteem, and that when we don't have it, it's just like the pits. Um, but in reality, what happens is alcohol. I find is just shutting off the bad stuff, right? right. So like. We have all these things in our life, and it's like you get in a fight with the spouse. Now, I could get in a fight with the spouse, and I can go sit outside, and I could be like, you know, it's not the end of the world. Now, my brain wants to go sit in a chair, and it wants to talk about everything we talked about. It wants to talk about how I'm right, how she's wrong. It wants to talk about how I need to decide right here and now whether I'm going to get a divorce or stay together. It wants to have all these things in my mind. So what I'm doing when I get a trigger to drink is it's saying, hey, the easy way out is to shut off these thoughts because when I drink, hey, screw it. She's wrong. I'm just going to sit here and drink. Um, money issues, same kind of thing, right? It's like, hey, we got money issues. I don't want to think about them. Um, isolation, we don't want to think about it. So a lot of this is, is more of a running away, okay? So triggers to me are more of like running from, Okay, right. we're running from negative feelings. I don't really think a lot of drinking triggers and correct me if I'm wrong. I might be. I don't think a lot of drinking triggers for me or for Terry are running towards like we're not drinking because, hey, I'm drinking because I want to, you know, feel great. I'm drinking because I don't want to feel bad. Right. Is that kind of sound how it is for you? Well, the, uh, yes, and and also I liked the feeling all the way to the end that alcohol gave me. So it, really, it was both. But uh, I liked the feeling that the chemical, the the chemical release that alcohol would give me, and that was because it would squash those negative feelings. Okay, cool. So it was kind of like, okay, I want to shut these things up. I want to stop these feelings. I'm going to run from whatever I'm dealing with. Right. Now, did you find, as I have, that in sobriety you could get a equal or better feeling from other things like meditation or bike riding? I know you like to ride bikes, uh, working out, um, reading, studying, relaxing, anything. Is there anything? Like, I guess what I'm getting at is – are you missing that feeling a lot? Like, is that something you're like, shit, my life would be so good if I could just have that feeling and not get drunk? Well, I don't have to run from my feelings anymore. I've accepted them for what they are. We were given feelings to, um, to get through life. There's a reason we have them. And um, they've, it, it's okay. I've learned how to deal with them. So, and um, as far as the, uh, what I get, now I'm I'm a much happier person nowadays than I was when I was drinking. Um, life is definitely a lot better in in all aspects. So I do get the the euphoria from cycling or hiking, and uh, just just living. Really, it's it's incredible. Well, I find also um, that one we we really don't we get to the point where we don't really need that feeling because we learn that the emotions aren't going to kill us. Right. I remember thinking when I was a kid, it was like, hey, if you cry, that's like the worst thing in the world. It's kind of like, um, did you ever watch Seinfeld? Of and course. <laughs> on Seinfeld, um, they were talking about guys who break up with women, and the women cries, and they go back to them. Right? And they're like, so I was breaking up with this girl, and right in the middle, she starts crying, and boom, we're back together again. And <laughs> they're at the restaurant that they always go to, and there's a guy across the way, and this guy's breaking up with a girl. And she's just in tears, and she's bawling. And the guy's reaching over like, hey, you going to finish your sandwich? Hey, uh, yeah, what? <laughs> hey, um, let, me, let me have your fries. And he just doesn't even care, right? And it's funny because George uh, goes through, and he describes it, and he's like, you know, it's funny because when the woman cries, it's like a fire. i got to put it out, you know? And um, that's kind of how we are with our emotions. It's like we have these things that we visualize as a fire, and we need to put them out. 
right? I can't cry. I can't feel this. I can't be depressed. I can't be sad. I can't be anxious. I need to run from it. When in actuality, you could be like the guy who's like, hey, have a burger. Let me have some of your burger. Let me have some of your fries in a good way. I mean, you don't want to like go around insulting people. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But the idea is, is you no longer have to run from it. And sobriety taught me that no matter what, I can get triggers. You're going to have triggers. I mean, Terry's been sober five years. He got a trigger from an olive. I've been sober uh, almost five years as well. And I get triggers. I smell stuff. I see stuff. Sometimes I just think, hey, I'm five years sober, man. I could have a beer. I've earned it, right? Um, And maybe I can, maybe I can't. The fact is, is I no longer need it, and I no longer care to figure it out. I no longer have to say, well, you know, that's a void in my life I need to fill, or I no longer have to say, I need to run from this. I can just sit and say, hey, these triggers, they're just there. They're chemical impulses in the brain that pop up and I don't have to pay any mind to them. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah cool. And, and, you know, triggers can be, uh, they can, they can be a tool in sobriety as well. I mean, we get a trigger with, we, we think about alcohol. It's a reminder that we are alcoholics and that we can't go back. Something simple like an olive makes me think about a cocktail. That's, that's some powerful stuff when I haven't had a drink in five years. Well, and it's, we have to really, I think, forgive our body and our mind for having so much to do with alcohol because everything you do, like something as small as a, an olive we could look at and we can laugh about, but really we got to look at what's happening there, right? In the brain somehow, and luckily I have green, so we'll draw that little green olive there, right? And I think they have like a little red, red thing on them, <laughs> right? So in our brain, we look at that olive, right? And your brain immediately, if it's like mine, it's going to start not only to taste the olive, but it's also going to taste the alcohol, right? You're going to, you're going to get that feeling in your mouth. You're going to desire it, right? And it's going to make you desire. So really, I think what a trigger is, is a trigger is a desire, right? So we have this trigger, desire, right? And this trigger says, well, I want this, right? I want this. And I want you to look at it as we don't need to give our mind everything we want, right? We don't have to. Like in our culture, in our lavish first world country life, um, we're kind of like, hey, I want to eat something. I go to the fridge and I get it. Hey, I want this. I could go get any kind of food from any kind of country right now, middle of the night. Um, I can have someone deliver something to me. Um, I can have whatever drink I want whenever I want right now. And we kind of get hooked on the fact that, hey, if my mind has a little itch and it wants something, I need to go fill that, right? And it's like that instant gratification of, I want to feel this now. I want to feel full. I want to feel shut off. I want to not feel self-esteem issues. I don't want to have anxiety. I don't want to have these thoughts. And we have that instant gratification. Does Does that make sense? Does that resonate with you, Terry? Yeah, absolutely. Instant gratification was is what drinking was all about for me. Definitely. And yeah. Now, what do you do now? So like, say the olives there. And is there a process that you have where you're like, okay, that'd be nice. But you know, it's a matter of recognizing that uh, the olive is making me think about the cocktail. And, uh, you know, um, one thing I do when I cater is I actually work with another sober person. And I just let her know right away. Just uh, I talked to her, and uh, that's that's a huge thing is is communication and being open about things, and uh, you know uh, what another one of the common common triggers for people is isolation, and uh, not uh, and the isolation in such a way where you don't open up about your feelings and talk to people about uh, what you're going through so that they can at least give you some. Uh, give you some advice on, uh, or, or at least just be a sounding board. It, it really helps to get things off your chest. So that's what I did right away was just talk to her about it. And then boom, it was pretty much gone. You know, it's a, it, it happens here and there for me after five years or almost five years. And, um, it's okay. I, I understand that. And that's because I work with a lot of alcoholics and, uh, I know that after people with 30, 40 years still get those triggers. And they just know that that's all they are. We don't have to act on them. No problem. 
Yeah, and I think uh, one of the big things also is giving yourself time yeah. and not not getting mad at the trigger, right? Like, if you got mad at it and be like, ah, oh, man, stupid olive, stupid this, I can't drink, my life sucks, right? You're going to go down that rabbit hole. Um, and to prevent that, I think it's it's like, well, yeah, obviously. I mean, I probably had, what, 15,000 martinis in my <laughs> life? Obviously, I'm going to equate the olive with that, right? I've had how many gallons of whiskey? Obviously, when I smell it, um, I'm going to think that. And, and, and we have to really look at the way that our brain responds and, and to kind of liken it to um, personal situation. Let's say you're like me and you had a childhood where you got bullied or you got picked on. Um, you're going to have a trigger every time someone gets a raised voice, right? Even if they're not li- like yelling or anything, you're going to have that trigger. And still, here I am. I haven't really been yelled at in, what, 30-some-odd years. Uh, but still, it's that trigger of, hey, fight-or-flight response. I need to get out of here. This person's going to blow um, because of the fact that, hey, I was conditioned. And what's happening with alcohol is you have alcoholic conditioning. You are conditioned to smells. You're conditioned to sights, to touch, to the clinking of the ice in the glass, to um, those stupid little tips they put on the alcohol bottle, right? That could be a trigger. Um, and we look at that, and we really have to say, hey, it's obvious. You know, It's obvious yeah. why we're like that. Well, you just mentioned the uh, being bullied, and THC Gamer mentions that he, he dealt with uh, – uh, being bullied in middle school, and that was part of what triggered him to start drinking to to get away from that. And by the way, THC Gamer, congratulations on 36 years. That's pretty, I mean, days. That's pretty awesome. Good for you. And the other thing you said was uh, triggers for me include music, sports, barbecue, camping, basically any social setting, LOL. I'm learning what healthy alternate hobbies I can take part in. What I truly enjoy in life <laughs> are weed and video. Okay. But, uh, but, um, yeah, talking about the triggers there, uh, yeah, for me, um, towards the end, my triggers were people, places, and things. So pretty much everything, right? And that's uh, that's the way this goes with a lot of us. And uh, we just have to learn to get through them. So, yeah. yeah and I, I can ahead. totally relate to that because, you know, I think what happens is with social anxiety, and there's a video I have on the channel that I would urge anyone that struggles with anxiety to check out um, because, you know, anxiety was a huge one for me. It it still is pretty big. Um, And still there's some times where I'm like, hey, you know what? I'd like to go to a stupid function without having to have anxiety. Um, And I always remembered that alcohol was my way to dampen the anxiety, and it, it worked, right, until it stopped working, which sucked. Um, but then I have that and I I look at it and I think social anxiety is really about being comfortable with yourself, being comfortable saying, Hey, this is where I'm at in life. This is who I am. I can go there for me. I can go somewhere and I'm probably not going to get bullied. I can go somewhere. I'm probably not going to get yelled at. I can go somewhere. I'm probably not going to have this, like these things are no longer needed, right? It's like you have the fight or flight, which was good when I was a kid. I got bullied. It was like run away from the guy who's a dick. That's good, right? That's a good thing. But here I am 30-something years later. I don't need to run away from everyone because not everyone's dick and not everyone's going to do anything, right? And we have to look at that and say, okay, well, thank you, former anxious self, for protecting me in middle school or whatever. I no longer need that now in my life. I'm, I'm good, right? Um, and just understanding it for what it is and saying, hey, look, you know what? I don't need to drink over this because drinking over it is just going to make it worse. And drinking over it kind of exacerbates things. I know when I drank um, for anxiety, I would like get pretty close to, to getting my ass kicked in the bars because I had a pretty running mouth. I wasn't like a jerk or anything. I was the guy who usually made everyone laugh in the bar. Um, but sometimes I'd say the wrong thing. And, you know, it's like the very thing I'm running away from by drinking is the very thing I'm walking into, right? You look at it and it's like, you got to fight with a spouse, uh, drink. It'll make it a lot worse. I guarantee it. I have had really doozy fights when I was drinking. Um, And the very thing I'm trying to run away from, which is the fight, is the very thing I'm exacerbating. Money issues, drink. I make more money now that I don't drink. Actually, when I was active in drinking was when I made the the lowest amount. 
Um, and so the very thing I was running from was the very thing I was running towards. Uh, isolation. You're going to drink your friends away, and pretty soon you'll be like how Terry and I were at the end, where, hey, the thing you're running from is what you're running towards with alcohol. Uh, right. Does that make sense to everyone? How we're running from it, but it ends up, hey, we're coming back to it. Uh, depression right. exacerbates it. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay, cool. That makes complete sense. Um, our Artwork 79 brought up one. I did. Do you have hunger on there? I hunger. can't read it. <laughs> not. Let's put hunger but, on uh, there. But hunger in general, well, you said a hunger that is something uh, something that really triggers me. And uh, by the way, I love you guys. Great. Thank, thanks, Artwork. And um, yeah, hunger goes right along. Uh, one of the uh, one of the main triggers for people is uh, hungry, angry, lonely, tired, and that covers uh, a lot of stuff right there. Pretty and that just, if you can keep yourself from getting hungry and control your anger, try not to be lonely, and make sure you get enough rest, that will build a base for sobriety, where you can deal with some of the other triggers that may come across in your life. So that's a, that's a good thing. And Naomi, great to see you again, 268 days sober. And there was somebody back up here, um, Richard, uh, where are you? 92 days sober, right on Richard and Sachin. Good to see you again. And, uh, yeah, good to see everybody. I would say another thing too, uh, on the hunger one, because the hunger one, I think for some people like myself can go a little bit deeper. Um, I had a pretty bad eating disorder uh it wasn't terrible but it was pretty bad i would starve myself um not terribly like hospital type but i just starved myself to where i wouldn't feel good and my blood pressure would drop uh and you know i'd be at the point of like passing out um that came from past trauma and stuff like that uh, but i find that sometimes if hunger is your issue uh maybe see if it's linked to something earlier and you know just focus on hey I'm just going to eat because, hey, I know I need to uh, maybe find stuff that you like to eat, uh, maybe get a consistent schedule. Like uh, I started working out recently. I lost like two pounds, which on me looks like 50 <laughs> on someone else. Um, but um, we have to look at that and, and say, okay, well, I started working out and now I have my peanut butter toast every morning. And I find that it changes my schedule of the day just having that. Right. Because then it regulates me to be hungry for lunch and then it regulates me to be hungry for this um, and not a bad hunger, a hunger like, hey, let's go eat something. Um, so maybe look at that and say, is it tied to something? Can I schedule it? Um, can I make sure that I'm taking care of myself or am I just making myself hungry so that I have an excuse to drink? Sometimes that's the case. Um, I used to do that where it's like, hey, this ain't nothing. Four hundred calories of alcohol can't fix, you know, and there you go. Uh, so we got to really focus on that as well. Right. So, yeah. Uh, Sylvia, you said, uh, I drink every time I want without feeling the urge to continue. I can spend years without drinking. Can I consider myself an alcoholic? Well, this is a good place for us to say that we are not doctors. We can't consider anybody an alcoholic or not an alcoholic. Uh, really, um, I just tell people it's for you to decide. And if you're having any questions... Uh, go see a professional, and maybe they can give you uh, at least steer you towards the right answer. I would also look at the fact that you're here. Um, like, people who don't have issues at all with alcohol um, don't usually watch videos about alcohol triggers and relapse. Very true. Um, also, I would look at what are the consequences in your life. Like, are there consequences? Because I've met people who are like, I'm not an alcoholic, I'm fine. Six DUIs, jail, uh, broken foot. It's like, yeah, yeah, you're fine, bro. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, you know, I look at myself. I had a broken finger. My business was going downhill. Uh, my kids were, you know, like, hey, we don't want to be around dad when he drinks. Uh, wife was like, you're drinking too much. And I could have said, hey, I have no problem. But look at what's happening in your life. Like, is this something that happens in your life? Um, there's actually a business book guy and he's right here. He's this Dan Kennedy guy. Good business books. One of the things he said in one of his books that has nothing to do with business, uh, well, sort of, he said, um, if I wake up thinking about someone three times in a row and I'm not sleeping with them, they need to be out of my life, right? If I wake up like that. Um, and it's kind of the same way. Like, are you waking up thinking about alcohol? Is alcohol right. on your brain? Is alcohol 
like consuming your life? Are you thinking, are you giving that much? Like if your day looks like this with your 24 hours, right? Um, if I was to get honest, I would say, okay, so I probably sleep three hours here, three hours here because an alcoholic never really sleeps. And then the rest of the time, I was probably working maybe four hours a day at the most. In the back of my mind when I was working, I was thinking about alcohol. Uh, when I wasn't working, I was thinking about alcohol. When I was cooking, I was thinking about alcohol. When my wife went to take the kids to school or pick up the kids from school, I knew exactly how long it took her to get to and from the school so that I could go to the drink place, get a bunch of drinks, slam five of them, pour a big tall glass and be like, this is my first one. That's insanity. That's crazy. So yep. if you are thinking about alcohol more than you'd like to, if you're waking up hungover more than you'd like to, if people are telling you, hey, you know, maybe maybe only have two today, um, then I would take that as an indicator to go and get another opinion. Go yeah. to the doctor. Find out what's going on. Because, you know, you can function as an alcoholic, as I did for years, and I really wish someone had come to me three years before I got sober and said, hey, you know, this, this is what's going to happen. And what you want to do is you want to look at the logical conclusion, right? So you have where you're at now. Okay, this is you now, and I think that shows up on the screen. Yeah, okay, there you are. You're at the very bottom. That's you now. And then here's you lying in the gutter like me. Well, we'll, we'll say me. That way no one gets offended here. Here you are with your drink, right? And, and sometimes you ask yourself, how did I get here? How did I get here lying in the gutter? Actually, he looks pretty chilled out like he's lying at the pool, but we're going to pretend that's the gutter. Put a trash can here, right? Um, he's got his trash can, and he's lying by the gutter, and he's got his drink. Um, and you ask yourself, how did I get here? Well, you got here because of the natural progression. Here, you had some warning flags, and the warning flags say, hey, you know what? Maybe you should watch this video about alcohol. Maybe, maybe you don't want to be hungover anymore. And then eventually, you're going to be like, hey, here I am, right? And the logical conclusion, the logical progression of where you get is pretty much inevitable, right? Did you see that in your life, Terry, where it was like, if I could have gone back 10 years ago and said, here I am having a half of a fifth, right? I'm a good little boy. <laughs> I'm having a half of a fifth. Um, but I still wake up hungover. I still have the boss or um, partners or whoever I work with saying, hey, buddy, you know, you fell over last night, right? And right. those are like flags. And if we ignore them, you're going to yeah. get to the the obvious end of it. Yeah. Well, for me, the consequences started to occur, yeah, 10 years before I stopped drinking. And they, the consequences got worse. And they got more often. And uh, they just continued to happen. But uh, did I blame it on the alcohol? Of course not. I just thought it was everybody else's fault. And uh, that's, yeah, that's what happened to me. I just, it just got worse and worse. And it's the, the blame of other things make me drink. Like I'm not physically putting it in my glass, filling it up and downing it. Like right. I drank because the spouse, I mean, if she would shut up, I wouldn't drink. If I won the lottery, I wouldn't drink. And we have to look at it and we have to get honest with ourselves. Hell yeah, I would have drank if I won the lottery. Yeah. I would have, it would have been instead of, you know, my $9 beers, it would have been a $10,000 Don Perignon or however much that is, right? Um, which, by the way, I turned down a free bottle of that. I won some contest, and they were like, here's a free bottle. I'm like, yeah, just send me the cash, <laughs> which is good. Uh, good step, right? I was early in sobriety, too. I think yeah. I was only six months sober. Um, but, you know, we got to look at that and say isolation. Oh, if I had friends, I wouldn't drink. You probably would. You got to deal with the main issue at hand, which is, hey, you're drinking because you like it and because you run from stuff and because the olive or whatever your trigger is, whatever signals your mind is telling you, hey, we need to do this. We need to do this. Right. Yeah. And, and Kim here mentions that I'm always thinking about it morning till night, sick of it. Mm -hmm. And Marcus just talked about how he always thought about it. Me too. My life revolved around alcohol, how I could get it, how I could keep it. If I had to go do a sober activity when I could uh, drink again, that, that was my life. Um, now, I have to think about alcohol. 
except I have to think about not drinking alcohol. Does it consume me day and night? No, not at all. It does have to be part of my life to to uh, make sure that I'm doing the right thing to stay sober, though. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's a much better way to go through life. And if we think about it, like, if I thought about my spouse as much as I thought about alcohol, I'd be the best husband in the world. Like, <laughs> no, I, There would be no parallels. Um, and I think we can all relate to that, where it's like, hey, we are giving so much time to this stupid drink. I mean... Literally, it's just a stupid drink that shuts off all the things that are trying to protect us. And it makes you fall over and it makes you uh, feel like crap in the morning. It gives your OCD like through the roof. Your anxiety goes through the roof. And really, all we're trying to do is say, hey, look, there's this big problem here. Right. And what I'm going to do, because there's this huge problem. And this problem is what my life is right now and my feelings and whatever. Right. And we have this problem and we're sitting here and we're like, okay, well, you know what? I'm a little anxious. And here's here's what you're working on. You take this little part of the problem and you pour your alcohol on it. Right. And you're like, woohoo, I'm going to fix this part of the problem. And you feel better about it. But in the next morning, you're like, well, shit, not only is the big mountain still here, but that little rock was still here that I tried to fix, too. Um, And I find that in sobriety, a lot of this mountain is caused by your drinking. Right. Because when I got sober, it wasn't like, okay, now I'm sober. Let's call up, you know, family members and let's hash out all this stuff. Let's deal. No, it kind of went by the wayside. My trauma and stuff was like, it was at bay. It was okay. Um, So I find that that oftentimes you're trying to fix this little thing with the trigger. It's like, here is this little thing. You're like, social anxiety is right here. Boom. There's that little thing and I'm going to dampen it. And you're not paying attention to the fact that these are symptoms of something bigger, which is being an alcoholic and, and, you know, not being able to feel anything, not being able to, to deal with your stuff. Yes, indeed. So there's uh, some other triggers that people, um, that we haven't mentioned. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, one is uh, overconfidence. That's, that's a big one. Uh, we got this, I got this sobriety thing. I'm good. I don't need to do any work on it. I'm fine. And uh, a lot of times that can uh, just, that can lead to the drink. Um, another one that uh, people that I'm, I'm sure they're probably obvious, but mental or physical illness, sometimes there's other issues. And that's why seeking uh, professional help is, is uh, usually it, it's a good thing to do. We talked about social iso- isolation, but uh, get, you know, another one would be, uh, something great happens in your life, getting promoted at your jo- or getting a new job. Yay! I I just got this. Let's celebrate. I mean, that's just something that's that's uh, it can happen. Um, another one, uh, maybe uh, like reminiscing, like me. I had the olive. It uh, reminded me of that drink. So just reminiscing about the or glamorizing. Yeah, when we did this, it was so great, and we we had a case of beer and. It was just so much fun Mm -hmm. and uh, just uh, another trigger that's an obvious one, especially in this uh, Christmas season, is going to those Christmas parties or social situations where everybody's partying and uh, everybody's drinking and you're the only one that's not. That's a a tough trigger and uh, you definitely need to go into those situations with a plan or not go into them at all, which that might be a better plan. So there's a couple more to add on. Yeah, definitely. And, and you know, when it comes to that, like dealing with Christmas parties and things like that, now I never really had that, um, that trigger when I was getting sober or trying to get sober. Um, but I would say the best thing would be step away from it. Uh, maybe not go. You don't have to go to the Christmas party, right? Um, Make an excuse. Be like, whatever, you know, I'm house-sitting. It could be your own house. That's cool. You know, (laughs) I'm house-sitting my house. (laughs) Um, Whatever whatever gets you out of it, Um, you know, and and, or be honest about it and just be like, hey, you know what? I'm having trouble drinking, and I don't want to be around it. That's what the— that's what the key was for me when I, uh, in early sobriety especially, was being honest and open about the fact that I can't drink. Mm-hmm. 
And um, and the other thing was is I that that first six months at least, I didn't go to any situations where alcohol was. I didn't, and that was because I did not know what would trigger me. So I had to learn what would trigger me, but I had to make sure I had the tools to um, get through it successfully without taking that drink. One of the tips for me, too, um, because a lot of times we play games in our mind about, like, I can't drink or I'm weak because I can't drink or I'm one of those, you know, quitters or whatever. Uh, One of the things I told myself early on when people would be like, hey, do you want to drink? I'd be like, hey, you know what? I've had enough. Like, I, I've drank probably more than the normal person will drink in their entire lifetime, probably three lifetimes. So it's not so much that I can't drink because I know I can, and I can drink a lot, and I'm really, really good at drinking a lot. I'm just choosing not to have it anymore because of the consequences in my life. So if we look at that and we're like, flip the switch, flip the narrative from, oh, I can't have a drink to, yeah. <laughs> That's cool. You guys could drink as much as you want. You're still not going to catch up with me. I'm just not going to have any tonight. You know, um, I had tons. And that's kind of the one things that I look at is like, hey, I've had plenty. I don't need to have a beer to know what it tastes like after five years. I've tasted them. Even if they come out with a new brand, it ain't all that much different. It's hops and whatever else they put in it, right? <laughs> Alcohol or whatever. Um, and we got to look at that. All right, we just got to look at it and be like, hey. I've had plenty. I don't, one (laughs) one more party's not going to be like, oh, now I've had enough, you know? Um, So we got to look at that. Jeanette says, nobody believes when I'm genuinely ill. They always say it's a hangover. Oh, well, you know, um, if you think you're genuinely ill, I would go to the doctor. You know, get a panel done, uh, get uh, uh, tests done. And, you know, if you feel like you're ill, go check it out. Um, now I used to think that I was really ill when I did just have hangover. So that, that's me personally. I don't know what's going on with you. Um, if you guys ever have any issues, go to the doctor. That's why they're there. Uh, my wife always laughs at me cause I'm the guy who goes to the doctor. If I fart too loud, I'm like, Oh my God, what was that? You know? <laughs> um, but it's always better to be safe than sorry. Um, even especially when you're coming off alcohol, you're like, Oh, I didn't drink that much. Go to the doctor anyway. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know uh, what's going on. And a lot of times, I don't know if it was like this for you, Terry, um, I ignored the doctor for a long time when I was sober, except when I had to go, right? When I broke my finger and, you know, I had major stuff that was like, okay, you got to go. I tried to ignore him. I didn't, I I did not ignore the doctor at all. I just never went. (laughs) But but Jeanette, um, I th- maybe what I, I'm not sure if you mean this by your comment or not that nobody believes when I'm genuinely ill, but maybe it's they don't trust that like you get the you've got the flu and you tell them that and they're tell- telling you that no you don't you're hungover, and if that's the case, um, yeah that's that's what alcohol does it breaks breaks our trust or people's trust of us, and it's a difficult thing to get over even after sobriety there's uh there. I have to deal with uh, people that that still question, um, you know, certain actions, and it's just something that uh, I just work on on a constant day, on a daily basis by doing the right thing and uh, let my acts, my esteemable acts, uh, speak for themselves. And it's uh, you know, we got to look at it and be like, hey, those people are they have the right to think that yep. we were the boy who cried wolf. Yeah. I mean, how many times did I cry? Oh, it's this, it's that, it's this, it's that. It's like, no, it's fucking alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it is. Yeah. Um, now, with Jeanette, you know, check it out with a doctor. I had two things. Like, had I sat there when I broke my finger um, drinking, punched a wall, got a huge wall. I get where the stud is, right? Just my luck uh, back <laughs> then. And um, I punched the thing, and my finger broke, and I was like, I need to go to the doctor. Now, at first, I was like, I think I broke my finger because... I didn't feel a whole lot. Um, So, yeah, obviously go to the doctor if you have something like that. Or like she says, she has a chest issue. Go to the doctor. Um, And here's another thing. When it comes to your health, who really cares what other people think? Like if other people are like, no, your foot doesn't hurt. Well, I'm sorry. Last I checked, you're not the person with my foot. I am. So I'm going to march my foot to the doctor and get it checked out. Um, So we got to look at that now. We do need to take other people's opinions into account, right? One of the things I learned in rehab is learn to take the opinions of others without taking offense. 
right? If Terry comes to me and he's like, dude, bro, I think you're an ass. I got to look at it and be like, okay, I looked in the mirror and I did not look like an ass. Okay. What about the, and I, I, I take it in and I say, is, is some part of what Terry says true? Chances are it probably is probably of course a little bit of an ass, right? <laughs> Um, and we got to look at that and we got to say there, there is some truth to this. Is there some part with Jeanette, with the other people that's true? Probably. You probably are hung over too much. Okay. That, that's probably true. Now, the other part, don't listen to that part. Okay. You go to the doctor, do what you need to do for the part that's the drinking part. Fix that part. Right. We got to look at that. Does that make sense to everyone? Absolutely. Keep it, take care of your own side of the street. Yeah, and, uh -huh. and listen. You know, if someone has something to say, listen. Don't, I don't have to be like, oh, Terry, you you don't know a damn thing or two. I'm not an ass. You know, I'd look at it, and I'm like, hey, maybe there's some truth to it. Maybe I can learn something. Maybe I can, I can be better, or maybe I yep. can work on something. Or maybe everyone in your life telling you you drink too much, maybe they're right. And maybe... By saying, well, maybe they're wrong. I'm going to go drink anyway. Maybe you're doing yourself a disservice. Yeah. Right? Maybe it's time to say, well, 15 people last month told me I drank too much. Are they wrong or am I wrong? Right. Well, chances are, unless they're in some kind of weird cult, they're probably right. <laughs> you know. Um, so we got to look at that and be like, hey, yeah, they're probably right. Yep. And I'll tell you one thing, too, is... Uh, Nothing's going to help you not improve your health as much as continuing drinking. Like, there, there's no benefits. I've never gone to the doctor and they're like, hey, take two-fifths and call me in the morning. Like they never said that. Never happened. Um, so we gotta, we got to be careful with that. It's, it's right. not a good health thing. So I think I'm done rambling now. Oh, you're, good. <laughs> you're a good rambler. In fact, <laughs> THC, THC Gamer said, you're one funny dude, Marcus. Always make me laugh, Thanks, bro. Gamer. Never lose your sense of humor. <laughs> uh, Brian G., ha right on, 18 days sober. Everything you say is right on and true. Good job, man. All right. 18 days, that, that early sobriety is uh, it uh, can be a difficult thing. Yeah, And you made it through Thanksgiving, which that's pretty good, right too. On. Yeah, yeah um, somebody else. Christmas and New Year's, and those are some, those are some good hurdles. And you guys right. can do it. I know you can. Yeah. Um, so... We got two in a row. Linda Marshall said holidays and, and MN Mama, sober Christmas makes me nervous. And yeah, they, they can be nervous here around all those all, all those people drinking and around people that maybe uh, you feel like you need to drink around. So it's a, it's a, it can be a difficult thing, but um, it's it becomes I don't know that it becomes easier for me every year, but uh, but I've learned tools to use. And that's what I do. I've learned to walk away. Um, learn to bring my own, bring my own non-alcoholic drink, or or know what I'm going to do. Have a game plan. Have people I'm going to talk to or call or bring another person that's sober. Lots of different tools you can use to get through these holidays. And uh, be sure to check us out here because we we did one on Thanksgiving morning. Yeah. I don't know how we're going to do them for New Year's and Christmas, but we'll be here for you guys depending on what days they fall on. Um, but you know. Watch a replay of the video before you go into your family situation. And also remember, you're you're gonna be fine. Like sober Christmas makes me nervous. It's because you don't want to feel the things that you haven't felt, right? You don't want to get in an argument and back down or be like, hey, I, I choose not to talk about that. Um, but if we just start like, hey, I'm gonna take care of me first, because if I don't take care of me first, I'm not gonna be able to deal with anything. And and there is no holiday. That alcohol made better for me. It might have felt better. It might have been easier. But in the long run, it didn't. It didn't. It was always like, oh, Bob's not talking to you anymore because you guys talked about politics. And I'm like, well, what do we say? You know, uh, so it never really made it better. It just delayed it or it just um, made me feel better about it. Right. And, and that goes back to the old thing of like, do you want to be better or do you just want to feel better? Right? Do you want to actively do something that's going to make you better, or do you want to just feel better about it? Right. Um, and that really is what it comes down to. And I would say that going through a sober Christmas and a drinking Christmas 
is probably equally as difficult. Probably equally. Like, you drink through it, you got those problems. You sober through it, you got you to gotta sit with things. Um, but in the long run, the sober one's going to be the one that's better. I guarantee it. So, yeah. Yeah, Kim uh, answered your questions on be better or uh, or or what well, I forgot what you, what you said, but anyway, she said both. Uh, and um, yeah, you you drink alone at home mostly. Uh, that's what I did. Difficult. It's a difficult thing to get through. Uh, Jeanette uh, said, "What about all the rest of the family drinking too much? Do I have to go it alone?" Uh, no, you don't have to go alone. We're we're here. There's uh, you can reach out to meetings. Lots of sober people to reach out to. Um, you can, like I said earlier, you can learn to uh, walk away when you need to. You don't have to spend the whole time with uh, people that are drinking too much. Um, another little tip: uh, if you do go to, like, if you have a big family and they're all drinking, hang out with the kids. You're gonna have a better time anyway, right? Like. I go and I'm like, let's play with the new toys with all the kids and let's hang out over here. And everyone's like, whatever, they're just playing with the kids. They don't even pay attention to the fact that you're drinking or not. Um, that's something you could do if, if you like doing that. Um, you know, it's like, hey, play with the kids. Um, let's see what else. Marcus says, great stuff. Close to five months sober. I quit alcohol and tobacco on the same day. Good job, Marcus. Spelled with a K. Uh, yep. <laughs> Um, I'm looking forward to remembering Christmas for a change. Awesome. Yeah. Um, memories are what you make them. You know, you can drink and make them bad or continue to make them bad in, in many of your cases. Or you could be sober and just have them be what they are. Sometimes they'll be good. Sometimes they'll be bad. But you'll be present. Um, and that's that, I think, is the difficult part for the alcoholic is we don't want to be present. I don't want to be there and sit and, and feel things. Um, I want to check out, but I find that when I don't check out, I grow. When I check out, I stay stagnant. Um, and growth is going to be the key to feeling better, right? And I feel better about it. Like you go, you get drunk at Christmas. I can't remember one holiday event that I get drunk at that I was like, yes, I love that. I was like, no, I, did, I didn't like that. Um, the ones where I was sober and I was like, hey, you know what? I was there. I was able to talk to people. Um, I didn't feel like shit the next day. Those are the ones that I like. Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah. All right. So, um, any questions? Any other questions about triggers? Any big triggers you guys don't know how to deal with? Is there anything on the list that you're like, man, that one gets me. I don't know what to do about it. Uh, go ahead and type that in the box. And let me see if I can get my screen going here. And I, th I think the most common one that I do here is is what uh, what uh, I think as Jeanette said that I just uh, touched on earlier, where you know the rest of the family is drinking too much, and uh, what do you do when the rest of the family is drinking too much? And that's that that's an important one for many people. For me, I uh, I actually just stayed away is what I did at first. I didn't didn't celebrate the holidays with anybody uh, except other sober people i did not isolate i made sure i was with other people but uh the drinking people i stayed away from mm -hmm. so what about you marcus uh stay away is a big one um out myself was another uh, i just i came out as soon as i got out of rehab because i knew the number one thing i can do is tell everyone i knew that hey i'm not drinking i'm an alcoholic yeah. Um, and sometimes that's a vulnerable thing to do, but you know what? Screw it. That's where I'm at in life right now. It's not a weak thing. It's what happens. Like I guarantee you, if you take a normal person off the road, normal guy, and you give him as much alcohol as I had with the frequency I had it, dude would be an alcoholic because eventually that's what alcohol does to you, right? It dampens all the stuff. So you're like, it dampens all this. And what happens is the level goes down. You get in a fight with the spouse you drink, you can take more shit, right? You're like, wow, you know, I could take a beating and whatever. Um, then when you don't drink, you can only take a tiny bit, right? You're like, ah, what are you doing, man? You yelled at me. Why do you hate me? Um, money issues, right? When you have money issues, you 
it gets totally exacerbated. What happens is your anxiety levels, your stress levels, and everything, um, they get dampened, right? So when you feel the tiniest bit of anxiety, you can't handle it, right? It's like boom, 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 boom. And what happens is your waking state, like your normal state, let's say this is you, right? When you drink and you continue to drink, okay, here's your drink. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Put a little straw in there, right? Uh, when you drink, which you should never drink alcohol with a straw. That's just, that's messed up. But don't drink alcohol anyway. That's, right? So we have that. And we're like, okay, um, the level goes down. So what happens is this dampens it. So you are not feeling your anxiety levels rise, right? So your anxiety levels are rising, but because you're drinking, it feels like you're normal. So you have to drink to be normal, right? And your normal level goes up and up and up and up and up and up. And now when you get sober up here, your normal level is way high and you feel like crazy, right? You can't even walk down the street like how I was. I couldn't walk down the street because my levels were so high, right? Um, because you're, have, you're used to having so much alcohol. It's like, you know, pain meds or whatever. You have one and then pretty soon you're like, well, one doesn't do a damn thing. You gotta have two. Well, now two doesn't do anything and on and on and on we go. And that's how people get addicted. Same thing happens with alcohol, right? You're getting the level where it's like, well, now i got to have five drinks for my anxiety. Well, now i got to have ten. And it's like, well, dude, 30 years ago, a half a drink would do it. Why do you need ten now? That's because right. your base level has changed. Um, and that's why these triggers come out of the woodworks, because they were hiding. Now they're like, well, here we are, right, because your, your base level has changed. I hope that makes sense to you guys. Uh, but the base level is a very important thing. So, which is really cool. Uh, THC Gamer, if you want to send us that, um, I think you can send me a message here on the channel, I think. Um, or you could post it as a comment if it's not like 100 pages long. Um, and then that way everyone could see it on there. Just make sure that you have the rights to the poem if you're going to be posting it. All right, you want to take some other questions there? Uh, Linda says, I want to, it's my, I think you, I think you were trying to say, I want to quit. It's my birthday, 30th November, and I want to be on day two tomorrow as I want to give up and attend a group my doctor has sent to me. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can, it's up, to, it's up to you to, to, to do it, but your doctor sent you to, uh, uh, must be a sobriety group that he sent you to. And uh, they're pro they're in the same boat as you, so it's it's always good to have that uh, that camaraderie and uh, people that are going through the same things that you are, and they, maybe they're a little bit ahead of you, or maybe they have a, a half a day less than you have today, <laughs> and uh, you know it's it's great to see where other people are coming from. So good job there, um, Kim. You said you were, you said I was wondering if I should tell people and. Um, well, Marcus was open with his sobriety, and I am open with my sobriety, but uh, it, it's really, uh, it depends on you. Uh, there's people that can't, that, that can't come out and say that, and maybe it's because of a business, business thing or something like that. You know, in, in uh, AA, the first, uh, the, there's a reason they're called Alcoholics Anonymous, because a lot of them, uh, they couldn't come out and say that they were alcoholics there was a stigma against it and uh, it would have hurt them you know financially and in, in, in their business mm -hmm. so that's something that you're gonna have to figure out if if you should me i'm open with it yeah and luckily in our society we've come a long way from what was happening in the 20s um where you know it's a lot more people understand it like in the 20s it was still guy's weak guy can't hack it what's wrong with him um now we understand that that's what alcohol does in large quantities. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty obvious. It's like very obvious, you know? Um, so we got to look at that and, and focus on it. Yeah. The other thing with being open about it is it gave me a lot of, uh, it gave me one more piece of accountability. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't pick up that drink. And relief. Yeah. And now everyone knows. Big deal. You know, and then I, you control I, it. Like, yeah, you know, I think one of the cool things is when you come out, and talk about your alcoholism, obviously, if it's safe and good to do so, um, you control the conversation. If someone else finds out, it's going to be a lot harder, right? Because then it's like, oh, you hear about Bob? He can't this or he can't that. But if you control the narrative and you're like, yeah, 
So I drank too much. I'm, I'm quitting or I quit. Um, I just don't like the way it makes me feel. I don't want to do it anymore. Well, well, did you do this? Did you have to do that? Come on, can't you have a little? No, I choose not to. End of story. Um, and when you have the power, it really, really, really helps. Yeah. Right? Because then you're like, hey, this is my narrative. This is my show. This is my life. Um, there you go. And hey, I already had plenty of, to drink. Right. Your one little glass of wine is not going to compete with the bottles of wine I had each night. So I'm good. Oh, won't you just want to taste this? I've tasted pretty much all the alcohol. I'm good. You know, I don't think potato vodka is much different than regular. <laughs> and there actually is a potato vodka. Some guy tried to give me that. I'm like, regular vodka sucks. Why would I want potatoes in it? Yeah, I think it's made from potatoes, but yeah. Okay. Uh, you want to take our Melanie and... I sure. Think... Okay. Our Melanie, um, my dad just got out of rehab yesterday and he immediately got out and drank. He had a court date today for a DUI, lives in another state, and I don't know how to support him and encourage him. That's a, yeah, that's a very tough one. And all you can do is uh, is just what you have control over. Uh, keep on doing what you're doing. Call him. Try and get, try and get him to uh, uh, check us out here. Or get to a get to a twelve step meeting, or go to a doctor, or something. But you know, a person from my experience, they're not going to get sober until they want to get sober. So uh, that's a difficult one. I'm so sorry you have to go through that. I would also look at um, one of the things that that I really liked, and correct me if I'm wrong, Terry, because uh, you have the experience with this part. Um, when someone goes to rehab and relapses after. The initial response is you just flushed rehab down the toilet. And I don't think that's necessarily the case because I think we built a base of knowledge, right? Like the Terry that came out of rehab was a lot stronger and had a lot more ammo and, and um, understanding than the Terry or Marcus that went into rehab. Absolutely. Um, and so for your dad, that base is there. Yeah. He knows, like he just got out of rehab and for 30 days, he heard about drinking, hopefully, if he went to a good one. Um, so use that base. Yeah. Use that when you talk to him. Say, hey, you know what? I remember when you're in rehab, they told you this, this, and this. Remember that, Dad. Um, yeah. You know, they also told you to do meetings. Would you like me to go with you? Maybe go with them. As anxious right. as it might make you, just go with him. Um, you know, uh, try to be there, uh, but not at the detriment of your personal health. Um, you know, we got to be there for people, but not at the detriment of our health. It's kind of like the airplane. Uh, when you're on the airplane, they say, hey, you know, if the masks come down for the oxygen, put yours on first and then put it on your kids. Now, that might sound ridiculous. And my wife's always like, screw that. I'm putting my kids on first. But what that airline knows is that by the time you get your kids air masks on, you're going to be out of air, right? Because you're going to have little Johnny swinging from it. You're going to have the other one like hitting it and everyone's going to be freaking out. And by the time you get yours on, you're going to be out of breath. Um, so the best thing to do in that case is get your own oxygen first, then rationally take care of everyone. Uh, same thing in life. Get your own oxygen first. Deal with your own sobriety first. Deal with your own issues first. And then go out and help others. Uh, kind of like that old Bible verse, take the plank out of your eye before you go trying to get the speck out of someone else's. Um, you know, we look at that and it's like, if you don't take care of yourself first, you can't take care of anyone. Right. So, you know, definitely look at that. And I, I dealt with what your dad uh, did or is going through. I had that DUI and uh, I went to rehab and I got out of rehab. I didn't drink the day I got out, but might as well have. Um, but uh, I did start drinking again, and then I was able to quit. And I do, as, as Marcus was saying, I do look back on everything I went through, even the DUI. It was all part of my road to recovery. And, um, you know, a lot of people, though, they get sober for the first time. So relapse is definitely does not have to be a part of everybody's story. But it is a part of a lot of people's story. And uh, sometimes it takes more than once. The problem with relapse is, is some people don't come back and uh, bad things happen. Like they don't live. Yeah. 
something like that. So it's, it's really important. But um, relapse is a part of many people's story, and it is it is a road to sobriety. And, and you know, give them the support and try to stay positive. Um, don't threaten them with uh, whatever. Uh, that, that usually drives a person further away. Just keep on supporting. Yeah. And also, uh, one thing I tell people to do is over on TalkSober.com, uh, we have a bunch of letters that I wrote that I'm making part of a book. Uh, you can download those letters and leave them around the house. Um, a lot of alcoholics resonate with those letters. Um, and, you know, I wish someone left them around my house. They didn't exist back then because <laughs> they weren't out there. Um, but I wish that was around my house because it helps you understand what's going on. And I think the thing that's going to combat alcoholism is knowledge. Understanding, look, this is what's happening. If anyone relapses hey this is why this is what's going on it's not the end of the world you're not back to square one unless you decide you are so many people get into relapse and they're gone for three years and it's like why well they got in a relapse and they were like well fuck i just threw eight years of sobriety away i might as well go all in and it's like well what if instead you just understood hey you know what? that's it it's an isolated incident today's a new day doesn't matter what i say doesn't matter how many coins i have in my pocket we all only have today. It doesn't matter how many years I have, you know. Um, what matters is how are you doing today, right? Because you're not living in all those years. I'm not living in five years of sobriety. I'm just here today, and I didn't drink for five years. Whatever, I could have not drank. It doesn't matter. What matters is, is where are you at right now? Um, and if anyone does end up relapsing for whatever reason, pick yourself up. Be like, no more. Because you remember what it's like to be good. Your dad remembered what it was like in rehab to feel free of alcohol. I'm sure there was a time where he felt great. Um, remember that and go back to it uh, instead of wallowing and, oh, well, you know, screw it. I, I failed. No, you didn't. You, you, you drank. You drank for the last however many years. It's pretty obvious that it's going to be difficult sometimes to yeah. stop. It's pretty obvious that all these things are going to combat you and you don't have the tools right now. Or maybe you just don't have the tool at that particular moment. Right. Maybe that's it. Maybe you just need a new tool. So instead of going and, hey, you know what? Forget it. My life sucks. Let's go drink. Uh, maybe look at it and be like, well, maybe I need a new tool. You know, you put that in your belt. You're like, okay, now I, now I can combat that. And you just start looking at it. You're like, when I start romanticizing drinking. What am I going to do? I'm going to be like, whatever. Instead, I'm going to think for every time I romance, oh, man, I remember that drink sitting out by the pool, little cubes of ice clinking around, little olive or whatever it is you like in it, umbrella. Oh, yeah. Let's think about the hangover. So every time you romanticize, think about the hangover. Picture yourself being nauseous, feeling like you're going to die, feeling like crap, having OCD about the night before combat it with that illness go to the doctor right go to the doctor say hey you know what i could sit here and think about this all i want but the doctor went to college for it confidence do things that make you confident or say you know why do i care anyway why do i care why does it matter why do i need this huge level of confidence why does it matter that i have no confidence it's a, why does it even matter i'm here i'm now and that part doesn't matter or if you, like, party with friends, right? Combat it with some. Get tools so that every time you, you have this, I've got to fight with a spouse, okay, you got this tool. Here we go. It's not the end of the world. We don't need to divorce or stay together right now. Nobody needs to move out. I'm good, right? Does that, are there tools like that that you use, Terry? Every day, all day long. I use the tools that we talk about in, uh, at, on Talk Sober and uh, Every Day Sober. Absolutely. And things that uh, things that help me stay accountable, like being open with uh, with everybody I know about my alcoholism and um, yeah, tool. And then those little daily tools like that we're talking about as far as how to, how to deal with the triggers, like don't get hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Pay attention to my emotions. Understand that they happen. Don't worry about what other people um, are thinking of me. Listen to what they're saying. Maybe they have a good point. Try and see their side of it, but uh, don't let, don't worry about it. Worry about myself. I can't control what they're thinking about, about me. 
and they're probably actually thinking about me a lot less than I think they are. So, <laughs> yeah. If you have teenage kids, that becomes a uh, normal phrase in your house. No one's thinking about you as much as you are. Yep. I doubt the people are sitting there wondering about your jacket. They're too busy wondering if you're thinking about their jacket. So, you know. Um, Linda says something. She says, I've been trying for three years and stayed sober for three months. And three times she managed to get two weeks. So, Linda, what I'm hearing <laughs> is you have the tools to stay sober. Like, if you were able to string three months together, you could, you could string a year together. Um, you just have to focus on what worked. Focus on what worked and focus on what took you out, right? What was the, the uh, effort or what was the deciding factor that said, I'm out? Um, and focus on what you did, right? Because there's, there's clues. There's like little breadcrumbs of, okay, well, when I was sober, I woke up earlier. Um, I had my breakfast and, um, you know, I didn't go to bars and look at what you did because you can take that and isolate it and make that a way of life. Instead of having life happen to you, which most of us go through life as if it's happening to us. That happened to me. I lost my job. I got this. They yelled at me. There's traffic, so I'm late. Right? And it's like, well, there's traffic for 2 million people in your city. Uh, I don't think it's just for you. Um, but start to look at that and start to look at, like, let's live life on purpose. Let's wake up. And let's take charge. Terry wakes up. Boom. We're going to do this sobriety thing. We're going to go to a meeting. We're going to do that. I wake up. Here's what we're going to do. We're not going to go to the bar. Um, I'm going to have this. Here's what I'm going to order when I go out to lunch. Um, here's what I'm going to do when I'm stressed, right? We have a plan and we're not looking at life as, oh, well, you know, that happened to me, right? I'm no longer a victim of my circumstances. I'm just going through just like everyone else, right? And I think if we look at it that way, it starts to change things. So, yeah. Well said. All right. Let's take a couple others, and then uh, I think we're at about time. Let's see. Um, well, right after that, THC Gamer says, thinking about all the ways you, the ways you can lose your life by black, blackout drunk might not even have a chance to nurse a hangover. Um, yeah, very true. Uh, Brian G, the letters and talks work. I started uh, a month or two before I got sober listening, drank while I listened till one day I said, I'm done. Sober life is much better. And oh. yeah, sober life is much better. And, and that's, uh, yeah, if you're, if you're still drinking, keep on trying. Well, obviously you're not. You've got that 32 days, I think is what it was. Good job. But uh, if anybody out there is still drinking, just try start start tomorrow. It's okay. If you need to see a doctor about it, definitely do that. Yep. And and really look at things that work. Like for Brian, he's like the letters and talks work. I started listening before I got sober. Yeah. And sounds like he's still listening today. Um, obviously, he's here. That makes sense. Right? Um, but you know, look at that. Like that's what works. If that works for him. Maybe it'll work for you. Maybe it won't. Maybe you'll look at the letters and you'll be like, yeah, Marcus guys. A crackpot. You're probably right, but some people resonate with crackpotacy. Um, so you have to look at that and be like, "What's going to work for me?" But do something, um, because right now you are you are doing a lot to drink. If you're actively drinking, and if you were like me or Terry, you are actively doing a lot. It's a full time job. Um, so you know, maybe thinking about getting sober isn't enough for you. Maybe you actually have to do it. Maybe, um, you know, half-assing it isn't going to work. Uh, like I know in their uh, AA stuff, they say half measures availed nothing, right? A half measure is not going to work. Like you can't half divorce someone. You can't half break up with someone. You can't be half sober, right? you you right. got to be sober or not sober, um, and you got to focus on it and say, look, I'm going to be as relentless as I was about drinking as being sober because in the beginning, you have to be. In the beginning, I remember in the beginning, I uh, got in a fight with the wife. I was about 30 days out of rehab, and I went to the pizza place, and I ordered my pizza, and I was literally shaking because I was like, I want, I want to order a drink. I want to order a drink. I want to get a drink. Um, and I calmed down, and I sat there with my anxiety and my shakes, 
And I was like, not today. Tomorrow I could go all out and get all fucked up, but today I'm going to stay sober. And it worked. Yep. Had I not done that, had I didn't, if I didn't have that tool, I might not be here today. Right. Maybe not definitely not on my sober channel, and definitely maybe not alive. Right. Because I mean, it was looking bad. Like the way that I got sober was a life and death thing. The way Terry got sober was a life and death thing. Um, and we got to look at it and say, I'm done. I am done with alcohol. It's not doing any good. Um, other people can have it, and I'm fine with that because it doesn't matter to me, right? Just not for me. Like if, if you couldn't have, you know, uh, French bread, you wouldn't give a shit. You wouldn't sit there and be like, all these other people have French bread, man. Life sucks. It's because you were culturally conditioned to think that alcohol is some rite of passage, some golden holy grail of life, and it's all just a bunch of bullshit. And we can let go of that and say, well, it's the same as if I can't have French bread. That guy, that guy can't have gluten. That guy can't have peas or whatever. Um, so what? So what? Here's where we're at. So I hope that helps someone. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Well, good job, everybody. And what we're we're trying to show you not not just how we got sober and and how we stay sober, but uh, we're trying to show you that we we're, we're having a great life and that you can have a great life too. Sobriety, you don't have to just be sober and angry and and uh, wish you had that drink. Yeah. We can I remember, have a great life. I remember for me, because a lot of people talk about, I can't imagine a sober Christmas. I couldn't imagine sober Disneyland. Um, I have <laughs> trauma around Disneyland from growing up, and uh, I always hated it because I got bullied there because I wasn't tall enough to go on the rides, and it sucked, and people made fun of me. Um, it was a place my dad told me he was leaving my mom, um, and all these things around it. And so I would be like, man, I can't go there. And my wife is a Disney freak. The kids are Disney freaks. And as a dad, I was like, I have to go to Disney. That's, that's what I got to do. Um, and I remember never thinking I'd be able to make it sober at a Disney thing. I mean, I literally, if anyone needs, like they have the little book of where to find the little my, hidden Mickeys in the restaurants. If you need an alcohol book for any of the Disney parks, I could tell you where they're at. Um, but I, now I'm able to go through it sober, right? It's like, hey, I can have a good time. I can go on the, the rides and have a good time and be with my kids and have a good time. I don't have to drink through this. And that's the moral of today's right. story is you don't have to drink through anything. That's right. You don't have to. So I hope you guys got some good value out of that. Uh, go over to TalkSober.com um, if you want to help support us. Uh, I'm working on my order form right now. I don't know if it's actually taking the orders. I know it, you can put it in there, but I don't know if it's taking it. So if you want to help support us, maybe just email us or something. Um, but you can check out TalkSober.com. Um, check out all the links. Put your name and email in so you get uh, notifications and the letters and everything like that. And uh, we'll see you guys next Thursday at 11 a.m. Florida time. 8 a.m. California time, and wherever you're at, do the math, and we'll see you then.